I'm a historian, and there's a lot of history on the Wind River and, and the, the Peel. We, we went from the top of the wind down to Fort McPherson, but I'm a historian, so you're, you're for it. Uh, on, on the side of the, the history part, if I can make this work. Um, there. So there's the Wind River there, and it's part of the Peel system that starts with the Blackstone and the uh, Ogilvy there, then the Hart, and Wind, Bonnet Plume, and Snake, and they all come down into the, the Peel watershed, and just up there is Fort McPherson, where we ended. There's the group, just a small family outing. My wife, my future son-in-law, Bobby, daughter, Julia, holding Spruce, their, their dog that they got from Attawapiskat, and moi. Uh, Julia works for the Gwich'in people in Dawson City, and, and Bobby is a, an environmental officer there. And uh, I think you couldn't get them out of Dawson City with a crowbar. They love it so much. Luckily, th th this is the <laughs> plane that took us into uh, Dawson City. And luckily, we, we didn't see that sign until we were leaving the aircraft. And th there's Julia and Bobby. Uh, as you can see, Julia gets very excited before a canoe trip. Usually we have to tie her up till we're ready to go. Uh, that's getting ready, the, the, the usual. This is an otter to take us into McCluskey Lake, which is the headwaters of the, of the wind. And that is probably the, we're over the heart watershed there. And then uh, the usual moment that so many of you know as the plane disappears and, and there you are. So the, the wind is a, a, a wonderful trip for someone in the 70s and getting a wee bit doddery. There's really no rapids on, on the wind. Just a short portage from, from this lake into a, a little feeder creek that then goes into the wind and, and down to the Peel, and, which is a, a, by the time the wind hits the Peel, it's a big river. Uh, there's where we started, first camp. Gorgeous country. That's very typical of it. And uh, lining down a very small little bit of water until we hit the, the confluence of, of that little feeder with the wind. This is a, a man named Alexander Henry Murray, who was a Hudson Bay sent in to establish Fort Yukon, the Porcupine and the Yukon River, in 1847. And uh, in just a second, I will show you a bunch of illustrations he did of the, the Gwich'in people that he met, first at, at uh, Fort McPherson, and, and then as he came down the, the river uh, and over the, the Rat and the Bell Porcupine system. But first, uh, courtesy of um, Gwyneth Hoyle and, and Bruce Hodgins, the map in the book that many of you know, just to set the scene, this is the whole northern Yukon and, and Northwest Territories. And over here you can see Fort Simpson on the Mackenzie. And uh, after the amalgamation of the two fur companies, the Hudson Bay Company and the Nor'westers in 1821, then this, this whole area up here of the far northwest was the last area that the Canadian fur trade penetrated in the 1830s. Uh, this is all under Sir George Simpson. And his main motive was to try and, and seal the back door to the, oh, sorry, to the Russian fur trade which is mostly in Alaska, but went right down the, the whole west coast as far as California. And uh, they, they'd been there since the late 18th century. So the, the Canadian fur traders are really latecomers. 
and there's essentially two routes in from the Mackenzie here at Fort Simpson up the Liard and, and through all of this. But the Liard, for any of you who have been there, is a very, very difficult river. And uh, the other way up from the Stikine and the Dees, that was blocked in, in these days by the, the Russian fur trade. So the other way of, of coming into this far northwest is down the Mackenzie, up the Peel, and, and then they, this was 1839 that John Bell first went up the, the Peel, and in the next year, 1840, he, he established uh, Peel House, which then became Fort McPherson, and then in, uh, shortly after that, 40. In 1844, he went over the, this rat, bell, porcupine system. And uh, then by 47, as I explained, Alexander Hunter Murray uh, was at Fort Yukon. And uh, these are his drawings of, of the Quichin people along the route. And they are the most northerly native group before you, you hit the Inuit. And as you will see here, very, very distinctive clothing, a lot of beadwork that, that came from the, the Russian fur trade. And they were famous for the, I'll go back, the right one, uh, famous for these cues. They let their hair grow throughout life and put lots of grease in to, to make it even better. And here you see a, a, a couple of hunters in that, that dress. This is, this is the same thing from the Smithsonian. And they were very much known for these Vs at the bottom of their dress, very distinctively witching. And here is, um, I think, the, probably the, the last moose hide boat that, that was built. And uh, there were many, many of them in the 19th century, but they were all temporary. Uh, they would put the moose hides together, and then when they reached the, the bottom of the river, they'd take them apart. And what they would do is the, the Gwich'in, until fairly recently, in, in, into the 19th century, they, they spent most of their times up in the mountains of the, the headwaters of the, the wind, the bonnet plume, et cetera, et cetera. And then when they came down in the spring, they would build these. Some of them, I've been told, went up to 60 feet long. You get five to 10 families in, all their dogs, all your winters meet, and get down to the Peel or the Mackenzie, and then take them apart. And that's why none of them are extant, except for this one that was built specially in uh, 1981, I believe, and was, was used um, to recreate all of, all of this and uh, filmed by the, the National Film Board. And this exact craft, some of you probably have seen it because it is now in the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center in, in Yellowknife. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. If you're there, you must go and, and see it. This is the other kind of Gwich'in craft. Uh, these are a couple of shots I've done of, of the models that Tappan Adney put together. And uh, you, will see, you can see that they're very, very finely made canoes. The, the Gwich'in were wonderful, wonderful canoe makers. And uh, I put this one in because you can see the, the bow here is one piece of birch bark, and it has no lashing. They wet it, heated it over the campfire, put it over, and when it dried, it, it's so tight you can't get it off. And here is our, our one Gwich'in canoe in the Canadian Canoe Museum in Peterborough. And what is so wonderful about this craft, it's one of my favorite in the whole museum. Uh, we had a, a, a fellow named Don Gardner from the Glenbow doing some repair work on it. And he took it apart and then said, just watch me put it back together. And, and Suddenly, as he pressed at a certain point, it just, it, it was like a bird taking flight. And he just kept muttering about being a Stradivarius. But 
here you can see on the stern, those are Chinese trade beads, and all of the lashing there is Chinese rattan. And this is a product of the Russian fur trade, and more to the point, it's part of a round the world annual trade based mainly on Boston, but also on London. And they would come around the Cape, they'd spend the summer on the west coast here uh, gathering sea otter, which were the, the prized of, of any pelt in the fur trade. And then they'd go and have a good time in Hawaii for a bit. And then they would go to Canton and Macau to trade the, the sea otter pelts. And uh, that was all closed. They couldn't go inland. It was almost the reverse of, of your picture of, of, of native people having to trade through a little slot in some fort. The Chinese were doing the same to the, the Boston traders. But those sea otter pelts only went to Chinese aristocracy. If you were an ordinary sort of person and found with a sea otter pelt, death penalty, quite literally. And then, and then from Canton around and, and back to Boston and London, around the world yearly. I just have a, a few slides here of um, some of the country up there. The, the country changes quite dramatically from the upper wind to, to the lower. And I love this one of the, sorry, it looks like a sort of witch's hat there on, on that mountain. Glorious sunsets. We were lucky in, in the weather. And this is the kind of country we were paddling through. I say no real portages. You could just sit and look at this glorious scenery. And terrific fishing. There's a, a, a grayling, any of you know. It's, it, I, to me, it's my favorite fish up there. And within about three and a half minutes, Bobby caught four of these and on to the skillet almost immediately. And I put this one in here, not to advertise, I guess I shouldn't say the name, but this is the first trip where we've, we've used these fold-up chairs and, and uh, they are quite marvelous and they, they fold up into nothing, so they're not much of a weight. And here is Spruce uh, with her daily lesson in, in, in deportment. You can see. But it doesn't take very well because immediately she would be off like this. And <laughs> it was virtually impossible to, to convince her of the beauties of, of no trace camping. Uh, and she was convinced she was digging out grizzlies. <laughs> and this, this was our, our favorite camping spot of, of all. And again, the weather was in our favor and we could walk and, and glorious rock formations up there. And of course, the one day that we hit this ice, and then of course it was raining and we had a really nasty day. This was the only ice we ran into on the river, but it, there was lots of it. And there we are at the confluence of the, the Peel and the Little Peel. And again, lots of, lots of history here, uh, including the famous port, uh, the, um, patrol that usually went from Dawson City to McPherson, but this one in, in 1910, 1911 came the other way. And this map shows how they had to cut off at the Trail River to Mountain Creek. And then they came up the wind and then into the Little Wind. I have a close-up map that I'll show you of that part. Uh, and I'm, maybe somebody knows better than I do, but I'm assuming that they went up the wind to avoid 
Aberdeen Canyon, which is just upriver on the Peel, a little bit from the wind, between the, the, the wind and the heart. And uh, Nicola and I did a trip in 1982 on the Blackstone and Peel and did the hideous Aberdeen portage through this stuff, five miles through, through this muck and deadfall and, and stuff you had to balance on or you were up to your knees in, in muck. It was, it was just hideous. So anyway, the, the patrols, the mounted police patrols avoided all of that by coming up the wind, the little wind, and then they were to find Forest Creek and through the, to the, um, pass through the heart and then, and then down 12 Mile and to Dawson. This was led by Fitzgerald, Inspector Fitzgerald, with three other Mounties, and they lost their way. And there's a lot of stuff written about this, still speculation, why they didn't have a native guide. It's the only one between, of, of all of them, from 1904 to 1921, the annual patrols of the Mounted Police, it's the only one that didn't have a native guide. And I, I truly believe that Fitzgerald tried very hard and wasn't able to get a native guide. And that's why things went so, so terribly wrong. But the fact is that they got lost on that first portage up, up, up the Trail River to, to miss the big band, bend on, on the, the Peel. And uh, they found, luckily, a guy named Esau George who guided them through back to the Peel and he said he'd guide them to Dawson, and they said, no, no, we're okay now, because one of them, Carter, had done this route, but in reverse. And the tragedy really is, is that Fitzgerald believed that Carter could guide them, and, and he clearly couldn't. And when they got up the wind to the little wind where you, you saw the bunch of us there, uh, they, he couldn't find Forest Creek. They muddled around there for three or four days, and then had to decide to, to retrace their steps all the way back. The tragedy is that they were almost, a lot of people think, almost into caribou country at, at the Heart River, but they were lost. They had no choice but to retrace, and back they went and all starved to death. And on the Peel, this is a cairn from 82, the two of them were found here, and I'm happy to say that two younger ones, the two older ones in their 40s, made it a little bit farther along, and where Fitzgerald and, and Carter died, where this one is, they were within 25 miles of, of the person, but they, they were so starved they could only make a couple of miles a day, and they just couldn't do it. And um, after a while, the, the alarm went out, and uh, Dempster, I'm not sure which one he is there, after whom the, the Dempster Highway is named, set out on a relief mission. And he found the bodies. Uh, again, the tragedy of this one particular patrol is that particularly cold weather, sometimes down to 60 below with, with a wind that almost doubled the real temperature. But when uh, Dempster set out almost immediately in the area just after where they turned back. He found a, 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 a Gwich'in family who gave him 300 pounds of meat. So if only they, the originals had been able to go a little farther, they would have been all right, probably. And there is a moose being very coy and, and uh, doll sheep. So normally, those patrols should have found this kind of game, but they just didn't, and that sealed their fate. Uh, here is a, getting down to the, the bottom of the, the wind where it, it joins the peel. I've put in a, a couple of, sh of, of these at this stage because you can see ahead more or less a, a whole wall of coal, lignite coal. Again, this is just around the corner is where the, the wind joins the peel. 
And uh, I don't know whether there's a, a geologist here, but as I'll explain in a minute, the geological survey came through and uh, Charles Campbell believed that this was coal as well that had burned out. And later on, when they went past the mouth of the, the bonnet plume, which is nearby, they, they saw places like this still burning because there are huge, huge deposits, both at the bottom of the wind and the, the bottom of, of uh, the bonnet plume. And uh, then shortly after got into the, the, um, the peel, then we started getting rocks like this. And this is fascinating. And again, I, I'm a bit anxious about opening my mouth here if there's a knowledgeable geologist around. But I believe that this is a very good example of what's called continental drift and plate, uh, the plates coming over each other and causing the, these incredible pressures that, that force the rock up. And uh, if you've traveled the Alaska Highway, you probably have come upon a, a stop on the highway called the Tintina Trench. And that is a, a, an incredible example of continental drift, where the whole Rocky Range has just moved over. And uh, this, I think, is, this, is the same sort of thing, where, where you have these pressures that take and just thrust the rock up. This is the uh, entrance to the, the lower canyon on, on the peel. Uh, you come straight at it and you don't see that there's anywhere to go, but then there you are, and it's actually fairly easy water at this level. But again, you see the, this incredible force of the rock. And there's a close-up of, of that one. And into the, the lower part of, of uh, this lower canyon. And now here's Charles Campbell of the Geological Survey who came through here in 1905. And uh, here's one of his shots. And then there it is today. You can see, same thing. A and then that. Uh, and there it is today. And off to the left of that last one, there you see almost a kind of rock thumbprint. And you can see this, the incredible pressures that's taken the rock from a vertical position into, into the horizontal. And this is all, uh, and I'm happy to say that it's a Canadian who discovered the, this idea of, of uh, what happens with the continental drift and, and these tectonic plates that crash together and then cause this upheaval. Uh, John Tuzo Wilson, who I went to, to university with his daughter, and just as he was discovering all of this stuff and everybody was saying he was absolutely crazy, uh, I remember how excited she was by her, her father's discoveries. Again, some of the, the same stuff. And I'd love to know what that is, but we kept going by these extraordinary rocks with all of this coloring. And I woke up at three in the morning and thought the, the tent was on fire and then realized, so I jumped out and, and, and joined all the mosquitoes to, to get this. And as I was taking the shot, over, over here I heard a great clumping and I'm sure there was a moose trying to get into the picture. Now, this, this is from the year before our trip. This, this is Bobby, who I showed you earlier. The year before, they, they came down the snake. And just about where the snake hits the peel, they had a torrential rainstorm. And overnight, the, the peel came up 15 feet. And that was where they, their camp was. They, they had to move camp twice in the, in the night and then had this roller coaster ride down the river. That, that doesn't really give you much of an inkling. They said when they were at the height and having to boot it for Fort McPherson, 
they're so terrified that they didn't dare take a picture. And they, they said that, that it was so terrifying because you had these huge waves coming in all directions as enormous parts of, of cliffs would give way and come in and causing waves, sideways waves, to, to try and get them. Now, we cheated, and the last part of, of the peel, we got a ride down. You can see our canoes being towed by this wonderful fellow and his wife, uh, Tetlici, Stephen Tetlici and, and Mary Rose. And uh, I learned so much from him. And, and one, just very quickly, one little thing. Well, actually, I'll go to the next. Uh, one there. No, back one. That's his, his hunting place. And uh, on the, the wall of his shed, he had a, a grizzly hide, which he showed me, and he was in tears. And he said, why would anybody kill a grizzly? You, you don't want to eat it, so why on earth would you? But I had to because it was threatening my kids. But uh, there was such a, a wonderful sense of, of oneness with the land coming from that man. And the other thing that charmed me enormously was that we slept here overnight. We arrived about 2 in the morning and, and had to just have coffee and then take off again. He said, why don't we stay? And uh, there was a, a bed and then some other stuff that he pulled out and scattered around. And he said, you must have the bed. You're an elder. <laughs> the, <laughs> the first time in my life I'd ever been considered a, <laughs> an honored elder. And I loved it. And the, the lower peel is kind of yucky and muddy and so on, but it, it's still quite wonderful if you catch moments like this. But there's the other side of it. It's, you go to shore and it's just mud and mosquitoes. But then there, there it is. And this is getting near Fort McPherson. This is Shilty Rock, 11 miles upstream, I think. And they, they, with there used to be three of them, and the, the mythology is that those were three giants who'd done something unseemly, so they were turned into rock. But that's the entry to... And uh, some of you have read Ian McLaren's wonderful book about the ladies and the rat. And they, they, those are the two that went up over the rat in 1926. And... Uh, on the, the left is Gwendolyn, uh, Dar Darian Smith, and her partner, who actually wrote the book. Uh, but I put this in because they are typical of a, a type of titled English men, women, who love to go all over the empire at this time. I've been writing about these same people in the cattle frontier which was just bristling with, with titled Englishmen. And in uh, McLaren's book, they, he, he, in their diaries, they both oogle over Lazarus Sitinchinli because they, they thought he was such a spectacular piece of, of manhood. And they, I think they were sort of sitting there drooling as they were watching him go up the rat. Uh, but I put him in there partly because he is a a link with, with the next bit, and, and that is that he guided them over the rat and then left them, and they went on their own down the Bell Porcupine to Fort Yukon. Uh, but he was also in on the, the famous mad trapper hunt in 1931-32. Uh, and I'll go through this very, very quickly because you mostly know the, the story of the mad trapper who, the so-called mad trapper who, who built this cabin up, up the rat. Uh, and when the Mounties came to check on him, he blasted one through the door and there ensued a, a long manhunt, perhaps still the greatest manhunt in, in Canadian history. And it, it was extraordinary how he could elude these people for uh, well over a month through the Arctic night and 60 below, couldn't make a fire, couldn't hunt properly because they'd hear the shot. And the only way they got him 
was because of this, this man on the right, uh, Wap May, and his Belenka airplane that they hired to, to try and help with the manhunt. And it was May who really found him on the Eagle River. They found the tracks and, and, and they pursued him to the Eagle and, and got him. And you're probably familiar with that death mask. Uh, in, I think it's 1907, they exhumed the, the body. And um, there it is, trying to find out who he was. I don't know about you people, but I have great trouble with this exhumation. I think some things are better left alone and some things are best left as a mystery. But uh, happy to say they still don't have a clue who he is. The one thing is that surprised the hell out of them is that his teeth had very, very expensive and sophisticated uh, gold work. So he was really no down and outer. And very quickly, three slides left, coming back down the Dempster, uh, Stephen Tatlici told me that there was a huge problem on the Dempster now with grizzlies because he and a lot of other Gwich'in uh, hunt from the Dempster, highly illegal, so they've got to get their caribou and get the hell out of there as fast as they can, leaving the guts. And the grizzlies have cottoned on to this now so that when they hear a gunshot, they come galloping towards you, <laughs> thinking it's, it's grub time. And just a couple of last shots of, of the wonderful country coming down the Dempster. And my last slide, and I was going to say a lot about this, but time, no time, and it's already been alluded to. And my, my daughter up in Dawson City has been feeding me with a, an awful lot that has been talked about last night, too, about the problem with this whole Peel region now under terrible, terrible threat from uh, mining interests and, and the Yukon government, which has completely backed out of its, uh, I think, a, a semi-promise to, to abide by a lot of this planning commission that, that wanted to save 80% of the, the Peel region, and now it's under 30%. But it's, the happy part is that it's ending up in a lawsuit and Berger is heading the lawsuit. And you probably know him from the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline thing, but more recently he took on a another high value thing that I thought there's no way he could win this one about the, the script commissions and, and the Métis people after the 1869-70 rebellion in Manitoba, and he won it. So, he, he's a bulldog when it comes to this stuff, and if he's involved, I think there's great hope. But as you heard last night, get involved with CPAWS, and, and we all need to do our duty here. Thank you. <laughs>